but I'll have this F faded up. We invite you to stand if you're able. We're going to start with a song here. Yeah, we can clap. Would you sing with us? There in the days when your heart feels like it's caving in. So let the peace begin. Sing it with me. Sure as the dawn calls the sun. I'm not going to, I'm going to be brief. <laughs> Believe it or not, Dennis is going to be brief. Glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, so glad you've taken part of your Sunday or whatever time you're watching this to join us. And if you're new, we're really thrilled that you come to check us out. Um, we hope you'll like us. We already like you. So we hope that uh, you'll find a place to live and worship and grow and care and love and serve. So that's what we're about as a church. And, um, in, and we're going to do a couple more songs, and I invite you, if during any of these songs you would like a prayer, uh, we have a, Mary's over here, and we'll have another person over here to pray. Autumn is going to be over there. If you just need prayer for something, um, somebody will put a hand on your shoulder, a hand on your heart, so to speak. 
and pray with you. So during any time during the next two songs, you can sit or stand, it's up to you, but let's, uh, let's sing. to see it's constant every day every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are creating something good though this season doesn't tell my story I know you'll move mountains for me you're just that good so I give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause he's more than enough and he knows what I need so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause he's more than enough and he knows what I to believe in the silence I choose to believe you're working in the waiting though the future isn't clear to me I trust you anyway every breath I breathe Every breath I breathe, an invitation to believe you are creating something good. And though this season doesn't tell my story, I know you'll move mountains for me, cause you're just that good. So I'll give thanks to God. When I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough And he knows what I need So I give thanks to God When I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough And he knows what I need Yes, he knows what I need. Sing it again. Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why do I worry? God knows what I need. So I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough. Cause he's more than enough. And he knows what I need. So I'll give Thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough And He knows what I need Yes, He knows what I need Thank
Christ alone, you sing. Christ alone. very far in our world to see the storms, storms raging in Ukraine, and our hearts and our minds and our spirits go out to those dear people, um, the people of Russia, the people of Ukraine, to just the conflict. God, I know it's a big prayer. Bring peace. Bring peace to that war-torn place. Pray for two of our own partners who were there, Marianne in Romania and Sue in Poland. We ask for your grace and sustaining of them as every day they're up to their ears in helping people there. And God, even in our own community, in our own lives, there are storms. People were hit with a storm this week they never saw coming. But God, thank you that in the storm, you make a way. Just as in when you were walked the planet, when Jesus walked the planet, you, uh, you walked on water to get to people who were in a storm. And God, thank you that you come walking on the water into our storm and into our lives and provide a stable, ongoing, consistent, loving, I'm here for each of us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I want to bring you a few things that are going on in our community, things that you're 
uh, maybe not know about yet, but I uh, want to let you know. If you uh, pull out that program that you have, and if you don't have one, Mary's here. Raise your hand. Mary will come through and hand you a program and a pen. And uh, if you're online, there's a, a, a program as well. And in the program is a Connect card. So uh, the Connect card online is crossroadscolorado.com slash gather. And so uh, the Connect card is a way for us to be connected. And uh, if you're a regular, just write your name on that, your email, and hit a regular attender. And if you're new or fairly new or consider yourself new and you want to be in more communication with us, uh, just fill out new here and we'll uh, get you on our list that gets electronic emails on a weekly basis. So uh, it'll be a way to stay informed about what's going on. And then on the back is a place to check uh, prayer requests. If you have something, we have a prayer team that prays for people. And then hang on to that Connect card. Uh, through the service, because at the end, or you can drop it in the kiosk or, or hit uh, send, submit, and we'll uh, take a look at your Connect card. There are ways that you can communicate with us during the message, etc., that you're going to want to hang on to that card till the end. And uh, another thing in that program is the offering envelope. If you'd like to pull that out and participate, thank you to everybody who gives. Online, there are a lot of ways to give as well, even if you don't use an envelope. You can text Crossroads to the phone number on the screen. You can Venmo. You can set up regular giving. Um, but, but finances are fuel. They're food for our life together. We're not an organization in a sense. We're an organism. We're a living thing, and it takes food to survive and to thrive. And so thank you for the financial food that you provide on, on a weekly basis. And in a moment, I'm going to invite the auditorium host to come, not yet, uh, so people can prepare for that. Um, but while you're getting ready for that, um, I just want to give you a quick announcement. Uh, Katie Martinez, our beloved executive pastor, Katie Martinez, uh, has decided to finish her uh, vocational ministry with us uh, at the end of March, which is next weekend. So next Sunday, we're going to have a celebration of Katie, and uh, they're not leaving the church. She's just transitioning uh, she doesn't really know what she's going to do yet, but felt like, you know what, this is a good time. And so um, we're going to celebrate Katie's uh, ministry of 13 years of vocational ministry, and of course their family was involved for years before that as well, next Sunday. So after the service, uh, we're going to have the sheet cake, right? You've got to have a sheet cake, right? So we're going to, I don't know what we're having, but maybe it might be that. And uh, I encourage you to come and celebrate that time with us. I will invite our auditorium host now to come and receive our weekend offering again. Thank you if you participate, like actually put something in the basket. Um, we're kind of scattered out, so look around when you get ready to pass it and pass it on to another person. Um, but there's more going on around here. Make sure that you uh, check our website, take that program home. There's a big book sale, bookstore, Crossroads bookstore clearance sale going on in the atrium after the service if you'd like to buy some books. And uh, we're gonna, it's going to be open during the week and for the next three weeks as well. So uh, if you go, hey, I need more time, we've got plenty of time. So uh, get them while they're still available. And uh, camping season, our kids' camping season, believe it or not, is right around the corner. And so uh, we want to introduce you. It's going to be a big summer of camps, and we want to introduce you to uh, what's happening with Crossroads Kids this summer. Take a look. All right. Good morning. It is good to be back. Sorry. Wendy, I don't think the feeling is mutual. I don't know. They're like, you were gone? Uh, listen, if you're a guest this morning, my name is Ryan, and I am not a beloved pastor here, uh, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> so 
<laughs> it's good to be together. Hey, listen, before we jump into our uh, next topic in our series, Living in Christ, I wanted to just talk about what is happening with camp this summer. So, uh, show of hands, how many of you have participated in Adventure Camp in the past? Raise your hand at nice time. Your kids have participated, you volunteered, right? Absolutely. So, uh, Adventure Camp has been a big part of Crossroads Church for many, many years. And so, this year, we're excited that Adventure Camp, which in the past has been one morning, one week, is turning into an 11 week adventure camp series, right? So we are super excited. It's growing by leaps and bounds. It's an all day, day camp program that's getting started for families that are looking for and need quality, wonderful uh, care for their elementary children during the summer. And uh, all of it is grounded in kind of faith-based, at least our brand of it, understanding, which is exciting, grounded in the peacemaking path of Jesus with our kiddos, because peacemaking begins on the playground. That's what we like to say around here, or at least I like to say it. I don't know if anybody else does, all right? Uh, Peacemaking begins on the playground. So it's going to be an exciting summer, uh, and so I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Now, here's one thing. Some of you might be saying, oh, wait a second. What about I used to volunteer uh, and be a part of that week, and I loved it, and my kids used to come just for that morning. Well, guess what? Adventure Camp kicks off with Adventure Week, which is the first week of camp. There's a a well, half-day uh, program that's for everybody to come out to, just like we've done in the past. If you want to volunteer and participate, that's the time to do it. And so we're very excited about that. But here's the deal. Your kiddos are going to love it. Uh, this, these camps are going to engage uh, every facet of your child's life. They have really been designed to create awe and wonder in our kids' hearts and lives. Uh, they're going to like address and, and really engage the body, the mind, the spirit, all kinds of activities. Check out these weeks of camp. So the first week of camp is the quest week. The second week is called heart and soul week. There's an outrageous art camp week. Slime time week. I'll be on vacation that week. (laughs) Working remotely. I'll be in an all week long prayer and journaling session, which means I'm going to be watching Netflix. All right. That's what... That's what I'm going to be doing. Um, There's a Surf's Up Splash Camp this summer. Uh, Figure it out week. That's like been my life. (laughs) That's where we just bring the kids in and figure it out. Do it yourself. There's no staff there that week. Um, (laughs) Go Wild Safari. I don't write the copy for the weeks, by the way. Uh, Go Wild Safari week, Down on the Farm week, Twist and Shout week. It's going to be great. So listen, if you are a parent of an elementary kid and you want to get more information, go to crossroadscolorado.com slash camp. And you can find out all the registration information, all the costs are there. Share that page out, would you, in social media. We want families all across northern Colorado to know that this is available. It's brand new. We're super excited. Patty's been working very hard. So uh, we are ready to begin staffing our summer camp. So they're getting ready to go. Uh, The weeks are nearly written. It's going to be great. So I wanted to just take a moment and pray for our summer camps. And I also wanted to just pray for all of our volunteers in family ministries today. Tonight, we're launching a brand new student gathering night on Sunday evenings, uh, all led by volunteers. It's such going to be a great time. And so we just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to all of our Family Ministries volunteers, the adventure team, we like to call them, and uh, just pray for this week, this camp experience that is expanding from one morning, one week to 11 weeks all day. That's what we're going to be doing. So uh, it's going to be a fun summer around here. I hope a lot of things get broken. I really do. Clean barns are a sign of no animals. <laughs> Who wants clean barns, right? So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the creativity uh, that is producing these camps. I thank you for a church whose heartbeat is to love the kids in our community well, to establish a great foundation in peacemaking on the playground. And so we just, we pray that this year of summer camp would just be fantastic, uh, that, that you would do more than we could ever ask or imagine through the team, through the volunteers, through the staff. And we are grateful, Lord, for every volunteer, every staff member that works in all of our family ministries, from our babies to our high school students students. We're grateful, Lord, for that. We pray that you'd continue to give them wisdom to live into our values of creativity and fun and inclusion. We pray that every student, particularly every student, God, would feel welcome in our uh, gathering on Sunday nights, regardless of their economics, regardless of their sexuality, that this would be a safe place where they can experience the unbelievable love that you are. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Do me a favor, grab your talk notes. If you're a fill-in-the-blank kind of person, I'll be right back in just a second to talk for about three hours, get us through this next week of our series, Living in Christ. All 
right. Hasn't, the past two weeks were good. I wish I could say they weren't because I wasn't here, but man, they were great. I watched them, enjoyed them. Uh, it was wonderful. Last week, I visited a church there in uh, my wife's hometown where she grew up, and let me just say I'm grateful to be back at our church. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say, and I'll deny I ever said it. We're going to delete this from the message, so thank you to Pastor Katie for speaking and our founding pastor, John Smith. Incredible message last week. Thank you, John. It's always fun to have you back, except I always get the emails after you speak, John. Did you used to get emails after you spoke? So I get emails now like, it's so great to have John speaking. It's wonderful. I miss him. Next year is the next time you're going to speak. My ego cannot handle that nonsense. So no, it was great. I love it. It's so cool to be a part of a church where uh, I get to interact and, and be mentored and loved and encouraged by our founding pastor who I just met a few years ago. So it's really great. I love it. You're in a special place. You really are. This is a special place because not just of him, but you all. So thank you very much. All right, so we're in this series, Living in Christ. And the anchor verse, if you're kind of new to Crossroads or new to the whole church jam, I totally get it. We, every kind of talk that we do is usually attached to a bigger series. And I kind of pick one, one passage from Scripture uh, that we just kind of say, what is this all about? And we unpack that uh, over six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it might be. And our anchor verse for this comes from this letter in the second part of the Bible called the New Testament. It's a letter called Romans. It was written by a guy named Paul. And uh, it's probably his most complicated, cr- biggest theological book uh, letter that we have. And in Romans chapter 6, this is what Paul says. He says, consequently, you too, you also, must think of yourselves as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. Whew, that's a big one. I don't like the word sin. How many of y'all like the word sin? Raise your hand up nice and high. Nobody in the room. That's good. I don't like it because uh, for, uh, for many, many years, that word has been used to control and oppress and manipulate people. And so here's the deal. I like, when I say the word sin, a lot of times I talk about wounds, that we, we wound our world and our world wounds us. And, and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus is, is you could replace the word forgiveness with healing. That the gospel is about the healing of the wounds in our lives and the wounds that we have committed, and that's the beauty of the work of Jesus, all right? And so we're talking during this series that happens during the Lent season about how do we live the what's called cruciform life, a life of death and resurrection, and that's the invitation. We've talked a little bit about what baptism is all about. And if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to go back to week one. I talk a little bit about it. And if you've never gone through baptism, or maybe it's something that's weird to you, I totally get it. It's kind of weird to me. We don't, in our culture, do baptisms anyplace else, right? Like in Jesus' day, they would get baptized for all kinds of stuff. Uh, so it's pretty normal. It's kind of weird right now. But if you want to kind of understand what that means to us here at Crossroads, you could check that out online. We've got a web page up and everything. And we're going to be doing baptism celebrating baptisms on Palm Sunday in a few weeks. So that's going to be great. Uh, If you'd like more information, check the box. All right, so here's the deal. Today, I want to just give you a little warning. Uh, We're going to be using some words today that can trigger trauma in our lives. And so today, I'm going to read a passage uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, where Jesus talks about these topics of divorce and adultery. And if those are a part of your story, I just want you to be aware that we're going to be talking about that. But I want you to know I'm not talking about divorce and adultery in any terms that really deal with modern realities. Uh, So we're going to explore this passage, but if at any point in time you need to slip out, you want to grab a cup of coffee, just practice good self-spiritual care, okay? And recognize that this is not a space where we're going to be talking about when you should or shouldn't get divorced. We're not going to be talking about what constitutes adultery. So I just, but you need to know right now that we're going to look at this passage of scripture from Jesus and see what we can get wisdom in our lives from that, okay? So just please, by all means, uh, make sure that you're taking good care of yourself, because that's what we're here to do. Uh, We're not here to uh, re-experience trauma in our lives, right? That's not what we're about, okay? And uh, really, anytime you encounter God, we should feel grace. That's, That's the joy of Jesus. And when we don't, we've misinterpreted, we've misunderstood because God is love, regardless of what our story is of wounds and woundedness, right? So uh, let me ask you this question as we jump in. Raise your hand up nice and high. Have you ever in your life felt used by someone? Anybody in the room ever felt used? Like, you probably didn't need to even have a, a, a 
a story in your mind. <laughs> you were just like, yeah, I have. Okay, give me, give me a minute, and I can come up with seven, right? And how many of you enjoy that feeling? Raise your hand up nice and high. You're just like, wake up in the morning, go, I hope I get used today. I just hope I get taken advantage of, exploited in some way. Nobody wants to feel that way. We don't want to feel used, yet we all do feel used. And here's what's fascinating. Our culture is a culture that just accepts the reality that people are going to be used as commodities. Did you know that? We just accept it. You know how I know that? Because every corporation that I know of in America, including churches, have a department called what? Human resources. Now, the human resource department in its highest function is there to protect the human resources, right? That's the idea of it, really, to make sure that they have the, their needs taken care of, that they're protected. But, you know, we don't call these departments human support departments. We don't call them, right? We don't call them like human advocacy departments, do we? We call them human resources because at the end of the day, people are oftentimes just cogs in a wheel. Get it done. And this happens everywhere. It's not just in corporate America. It happens in church world. How many of you, some of you, I don't, don't please don't raise your hand. I'll go into a, a like, <laughs> spiritual trauma, you know, coma over here, because I know everybody could raise their hands that you've actually felt used in church, right? Some of you would say, yeah, I volunteered, I gave, I was a huge part of this church, and then something happened in my life, and then whoosh, gone. I could no longer perform the way I performed before. I could no longer give of myself the way I gave. I could no longer contribute, and then all of a sudden, I was just thrown out. It happens everywhere. Because the reality is I, we live in a world that just per accepts that people are going to be treated like pawns, that there is just this huge game of thrones that's taking place everywhere, people looking for power, people looking for wealth. And at the end of the day, we just kind of accept the fact that that's what it is, that at the end of the day, people find themselves feeling like they're just dispensable, of very little value. Like, if I can't produce for you, if I can't meet the quotas, if I can't just, then I just don't have any value. And what this is, is objectification. Right? And so objectification can be defined as the action of degrading someone to the status of a mere object. That really, at the end of the day, this person is simply a tool to get something done. And when we use people for our own selfish ambitions, when we use people for our own goals, when we use people to meet our needs without regard for their humanity or their agency or their dignity, we actually participate in this objectification. And I think it'd be good for us all to just like recognize we do it. I do it. I might not mean to, I might not want to, but I do it. And what happens is this objectification snowballs, right? It just snowballs to where at the end of the day, it just leads to this complete disregard and eventual disposal of people. Like, how can we have aggressive uh, military campaigns, offensive military campaigns in our world today in 2022? Because we see people as dispensable and disposable. It's how we can say that any solution that involves killing and violence is perfectly acceptable and celebrated. But it, because it all starts back with we've lost like this value of humanity. We've lost that people are far more than a cog in a machine, a resource to be used. And so the question I have is, given this reality, what wisdom does Jesus offer us around the objectification of people? And I want to look at what we're looking at uh, throughout these weeks is the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably one of the most beautiful pieces of literature. It's a compilation of all of Jesus's like, most important teachings that the earliest followers felt. And so the writer of the Gospel of Matthew probably gathered these statements or gathered the meaning of statements that Jesus taught over and over again and created this narrative, this sermon, and gave it to us in a nice, succinct pattern. And so I want to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32 for the next six or seven hours. I, I see I warmed you up with three, right? And, and what we're going to do is just kind of dig in here and see, can we learn and can we gain some wisdom? So I want to read all of it uh, before we jump in. And I normally don't do that. I normally don't read a big, long passage because I think it's oftentimes you're, you're going to zone out from me anyway. I totally understand that. Uh, but I hate for you to do it while I'm reading a passage of Scripture. But just stick with me for these five verses. I want to read the whole thing, and I want to give you a few reminders, <laughs> and then we're going to dig in verse by verse if that's okay. If it's not okay, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> 
going to do it. The doors aren't locked. All right, no. So here we go. Matthew 5, here's what it says. Jesus says this, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into Gehenna. And it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That'll make you feel real good inside. Just that's it right there, right? That's a tough one, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Like, that's a tough one, especially if you've been raised to say, oh, I have to follow the Bible. And if you know anything about me, you know, I think following the Bible can be a disaster, an absolute disaster. So I want to give you a few reminders before we dig into this, all right? The first reminder is this. This passage, we're looking (laughs) for wisdom, okay? I'm not looking for a rule to live by. I'm not looking for what Jesus thinks about my life, my marriage, that's, I'm looking for wisdom, and I'm, and I'm looking at it from a very interesting passage. I'm looking for wisdom from an ancient legal commentary <laughs> on Jewish law. What Jesus is doing here, there is a hot debate taking place in Jesus' lifetime around marriage, and it's a legal matter. And I just want us to recognize, we're, we're looking at a commentary. Jesus is weighing in on the issue, and this deals with civil law. Okay, it was all intermixed. There was no separation of church and state when Jesus walked around. Okay, so let's remember we're looking for wisdom from two or three sentences on an ancient law that Jesus gave. I'm not looking for a rule to live by. The second thing I want to say as we jump in here fundamental groundwork is that Jesus is not simply concerned with lust, adultery, and divorce, he's concerned with something far more than that. Those are manifestations, they're realities, they're issues that show up, they're the presenting problem, but he's dealing with something bigger, and that's what we want to get at today. And it's important to recognize who Jesus is speaking to. Jesus is speaking the truth to power and giving hope to the powerless. Like, ultimately, that's what Jesus is doing, and here's what's happened with this passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture has been reversed over the years. It has been used by people in power to oppress the powerless. That's what's happened. And and I want us to own that and honor that as we look at this passage together, okay? For some of us, we could just close it all up and go home right now, all right? But here's what, here we go. Let's jump in and look at these words, right? Now, remember the power that he's speaking to, all right, are men. Jesus is speaking particularly to men who held nearly unlimited power over women in their marriages, in society, in culture. So Jesus is addressing a massive power differential, huge. And, and, and we're getting all of this in like five sentences, okay? So that's what's happening here. So let's kind of look at this kind of verse by verse and see what does this have to tell us? What wisdom does it offer us? Not just, not just around marriage and divorce because those concepts are so different now than what they were in antiquity. But what does it tell us about objectification and the problems of objectification and what it means to follow Jesus in a world that is perfectly okay with the dehumanization of people? So Jesus says this, right? He says, you've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, now this statement, this way of Jesus talking, he does numerous times in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but I say to you, it's powerful. What Jesus is doing is deconstruction and reconstruction, right? So you might have heard this phrase, the deconstruction of our faith or the deconstruction of spirituality or of Christianity. And I would just say that Jesus is giving wisdom to the people through a process of spiritual reconstruction. And what this tells me is that deconstruction, the actual like calling into question things that we held as truth, things that we lived into, that this idea of deconstruction is a part of healthy spiritual growth. 
In fact, I would say that you really can't have spiritual growth if a part of that isn't the willingness to go through a deconstructive, reconstructive process. Now, I'm not a big fan of the word deconstruction. I'm going to throw that out there. I think it's become a catchword, a buzzword, and I think it oftentimes leaves wonderful, beautiful people of faith in a wreckage. Because if all we do is deconstruct, but we don't offer right, the path towards something more beautiful, then we're just leaving people in rubble. So deconstruction is a part of a process. Uh, Father Richard War calls this process the wisdom process, and I love the words he uses. He talks about order, disorder, and reorder, that this is the process of wisdom in our lives, that we live in a space of order. We think we have it all figured out. How many parents do we have in the room? Raise your hand up nice and high. Just own it. We won't, we won't look to see which ones are yours. Don't worry about it. That's that. <laughs> all right? Now, how many of you, you raised your hand, just think, did you ever think to yourself, like, I got this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail this parenting thing. I am not going to do what my parents did. Now, don't lie and say you never said that just because your parents are in the room with you. I know you said it, right? And then your kids started breathing. And you were like, oh, crud. Maybe you said even worse language, right? Like, I don't know, what am I doing? Right, so there was this moment where your life was ordered. This is what I'm going to do for my kids. This is what they're going to do. And then something happens and, and disorder comes into being in that parenting process. Anybody have disorder in their parenting process? Right, yeah, absolutely. My mother-in-law's raising her hand. She's like, yes, right? Let me tell Wendy that's what she said in church today. But here's the thing, like healthy spirituality goes through a process of reordering. Or we don't just live in a space of disorder. We ask, what, am, what, what is life, the universe, God, whatever words you choose to use, trying to teach me in this moment? And so that's what Jesus is doing here. There's this, there's this disorder right now taking place in Jesus' time around the idea of adultery and divorce. And so he's addressing it. So he says, you've heard it said, but here's what I'm going to say to you. Everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, here's the thing. Some, <laughs> the purity culture of Western Christianity takes this verse and wants to like superimpose this very bizarre sense of like, like you're not supposed to have any lustful thoughts. And if you do, you're a terrible person. Okay. Let me just say this out loud. Like you're going to have lustful thoughts. Some of you right now. <laughs> It's been hard to focus with this hair. It's going to happen, right? So some people say, oh, the Jesus is just amping it up. And let me tell you something, I don't think Jesus is amping anything up under the law. Here's the thing, <laughs> and I'm going to get to more of this in a second. Like what Jesus is doing, like think if you're a woman listening and you've had no recourse for like somebody wanting to divorce you and like adultery was mandated, right? Like Jesus has just heard, like all the women in the room have just heard, oh, like they know men. They're like, we now have legal rights <laughs> because my husband has committed adultery <laughs> with my neighbor. I saw him looking too long. <laughs> That's, so, so really, here's the thing. What Jesus is dealing with is the problem with adultery for Jesus was sexual objectification and emotional exploitation. Like that is the case of it always, right? That's the underlying issue when, when we're dealing with an adulterous kind of relationship, whether it be emotional or physical or anything like that, Right? And so what happens in that, in that setting is a person becomes a resource to meet our desire, our need, our hurt. There's a wound in our life. There's a lack of intimacy. There's a lack of connection. There's something that feels broken. And so we go and we find that someplace else. We have a wound and we go to someone to heal that wound. I believe deeply that's what's happening, right? And, and, and so Jesus is certainly addressing it. And in Jesus' day, right? Adultery was a big deal because, don't, don't get me wrong, okay, let me just say this, in a culture where you have ineffective birth control, adultery wreaks far bigger havoc than it would even today, okay, because you're dealing with property, you're dealing with people being cared for, you're dealing with all types of things, and so when you have ineffective birth control, there's a reason why, like, it was taken so seriously, because it had huge ramifications in, an, in a culture in that society, right? And so Jesus is certainly addressing the reality and the harm, but what had been to meant to protect society had actually become a very one-sided reality. 
And so here's what's interesting. Marriage and divorce and all these things that are being jumbled together in here had really become oppressive realities. And, and, and women had very few rights when it came to it. And so Jesus, what he's done is he has protected and empowered women by expanding the definition. And remember, we're talking about a legal definition here. Jesus is talking legally, like you legally have the right, okay? Now, here's the thing. Adultery, every person who's here in this, who's Jewish at the time, they would have known that the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, the penalty for adultery was the death penalty. Like in Deuteronomy, that's what the deal was. Everybody, everybody involved, done. Adultery was a big deal in antiquity. And it was a matter of like civil society. This was a, this was a like capital punishable offense, all right? So what Jesus has just done <laughs> is basically said, well, you know what? All you men are uh, deserving of death. And most of you women too, let's be honest. <laughs> right, I mean, that's what Jesus does here. And he's, he's, again, he's speaking about a legal reality in his world. Now, what had happened was, at the time of Jesus, the Jewish people no longer had the right to execute people. That, that was no longer within their purview under Roman uh, rule. They couldn't do that anymore. So what happens is divorce becomes the alternative and mandated punishment in both Roman and Jewish law. So you can't impose the death penalty. What happens is you impose the divorce penalty. And so divorce became this alternative to the death penalty. And so it's very important that we recognize and honor that in Jesus' day, what he's talking about, when he gets ready to talk about divorce, which we're going to look at in just a second, that divorce was a legal punishment. <laughs> it was a legal punishment that took the place of the death penalty. And it was in no way a protection from abuse. It was in no way a protection from injustice. It was a penalty that would leave you as if you were dead. And it was primarily used against women. And so Jesus is making this legal argument to balance the scales, to still speak to this appropriate nature of how significant and what adultery can do in a society, but not making it so one-sided. So let's skip ahead now to verse 32, and then we'll come back. But these, this, these two things are tied deeply together, adultery and divorce, because it was the, you, had, you didn't have a choice, by the way. According to, to the law, you had to divorce this person. So Jesus then goes on. He, now he's talking about divorce because the two were interrelated. And he says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, notice it's all his. This is the imbalance of power. Jesus speaking to power. Whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce, right? You're actually writing a death sentence. He says, but I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's bringing this all back into this. It's just an endless cycle of death. <laughs> this is what's happening. And so Jesus starts to address, now there's this issue with adultery, but now he's going to address the issue with divorce. And what, what is behind the issue with divorce is that divorce, for Jesus' time, had become an economic objectification and an exploitation of power. Because there were all types of dynamics in marriage in antiquity. There were property dynamics. There were dowries. You were paid. Women had very little status above property in many ways from a legal standpoint. And so divorce brought with it all types of property issues and would leave a person literally with a death sentence. No property, no way of living, no way of being cared for. Remember, it was replacing, when it was done as, as a punitive action for adultery, it was replacing the death penalty. But here's the issue. There was a power dynamic, though, because the Jewish law allowed any man to write a bill of divorce for any reason whatsoever. They could just say, I'm not happy anymore. I don't want to deal with this, and send you off. And it was basically a death sentence. And so Jesus is addressing all of this, that the fact was that men could divorce women for any reason whatsoever. And so Jesus is calling for and he's using this as an example, but I think he's calling for this bigger bit of wisdom that there needs to be an ending of the objectification and the exploitation of women by men. That's, I think, what Jesus is driving home. And, and by extension, he's just saying, stop objectifying people. <laughs> stop recognizing that people aren't people, that there's a huge issue. So Jesus is balancing things here. He's limiting the power that exists even though it might be given to a man his, you know, through the law, he's limiting that power, but he's still holding on that there are dangers behind these two realities of adultery and divorce. 
He's holding all that together. So now, with that in mind, let's jump back to verse 30. So with that in mind, Jesus says this. This is one of the most uplifting passages in all of Scripture. If your right eye causes you to sin, (laughs) tear it out and throw it away. It's an important phrase, by the way, throw it away. Tear it out, throw it away. Don't keep it. That's gross. Just throw it out, all right? So on your way out today, what we have are eye removers. And, uh, and it's up to you totally. You decide if you've ever, you know, just deal with that. He says, do that. Because it's better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. And then he says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Now he's going crazy. It's one thing to live without an eye, but a hand? Jesus, what are you talking about? He says, it's better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into Gehenna. Key phrases here for us to understand this. Throw it away. (laughs) Throw it away. He says, tear it off, cut it off, throw it away. Better for that one little part to end up in Gehenna than your whole body. So Gehenna is not hell. Jesus isn't talking about some place of eternal fire and damnation. He's talking about a literal place outside the city walls, which was a garbage heap, which was where anything that was harmful to the community was taken to be burned and gotten rid of. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, better to go through some some (laughs) self-censure than for your whole person to be useless to the community. Because that's what divorce and adultery would do in Jesus' day. They would make people useless to a community. They would create victims. And so Jesus is saying, listen, here's the deal. If your objectification is now creating victims, you got to stop it. you got to figure out how to do that. And if it's your right hand, better to cut it off and let that be taken out of this city and then live in faithful community. Or if it's your eye, live in faithful community. There's a lot of complexity here. <laughs> And, and, and so Jesus said, listen, that's the deal. And, and what Jesus is saying is objectification starts with seeing and it turns into action, right? That's why the eye and the hand. It starts with seeing, it ends with action. And that's the reality of all wounding in our world, right? Or all sin, if you want the Bible word for it. James says it this way in, in the letter that uh, James wrote, we have in the New Testament, he said, each person is tempted when they are lured and enticed by their own desire. What's that? That's a, that's a visual imagery, right? I see something and I want it. And then desire conceives and brings forth sin. I would say desire conceives and brings forth a wound. It brings forth a wound. And then when that wound reaches maturity, it gives birth to what? Death. It's a, it, you know what? Like People say, oh, I don't know if wound works. Works pretty good in this one. Right? That's the idea. Like, unattended wounds lead to death. Spiritual, relational, physical, it doesn't matter. So you've heard the phrase, where there's sin, there's death. That's true. Where there's woundedness, the end result, if it's left unattended without the healing power of grace and love and mercy and reconciliation, death is produced. And so this whole passage that oftentimes has been used, I think, to control people, to create moral theism, and, and to take concepts that are, we're pulling from a culture that is so different and so far removed and has different values and trying to apply it, like, we've missed it. I really think the heartbeat of what Jesus is saying is here is we need to crucify our objectifying eyes and hands. Like if we're talking about a life hidden in Christ, is a cruciform life. It's a process of death and resurrection. And that is to say that I have to crucify that that feeling, that reality that I just want. I want and I want and I want and I'm willing to use people to get it. Whether it's my emotional need, my sexual need in in the areas of marriage and adultery, or whether it's in my economic need in work, Whatever it might be, whether it's because I'm moving in in a month or so, and I might become some of you all with big muscles, best friends for a while. You you got pickup trucks. You know, I might invite you out to coffee a few times this next few days, get to know you, and then I don't talk to you after you move me, right? Whatever that looks like, Jesus is saying, to live in me, to live in my way is to crucify that, is to let it die. 
and it's painful, but you got to take up that cross every day. And so every day in your normal peacemaking life, and by the way, that's the way we talk about a life of faith here is life as peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And so we, we say we want to be peacemakers in our everyday normal lives. So here's how we crucify objectification very quickly. Number one, own your objectifications without excuse. It's the only way you can start to crucify him. You just have to say, here's where I did it again. Dang it. I did it again. Here's where I wasn't considering how my actions affected this person. Here's where I was using a person to meet my need. Here's where I wasn't considering their human value. Here's where I did it. And so sometimes we have to take an inventory. The Bible word for this process of owning these things, of crucifying, is repentance. That's the Bible word. That's the Bible word. To repent is to acknowledge, man, I did it again. I, I used my spouse. I didn't think about them well. I used this person at work. I used my neighbor. I got to own that. And, and that's where healing begins. The healing of that wound and the wound that I create begins in that space. I think there's a commitment that we can make. And it's, it seems kind of simple, but it's really hard. And that is, I'm not going to treat people as solutions to my problems anymore. I'm not going to see you as a solution to my issue. That doesn't mean that people can't present their solutions. That doesn't mean that people don't give of themselves or that you shouldn't give of yourselves. But I want to live my life presenting my resources, my life to others, not the other way around. I don't want to be looking for this person that can provide for me and this person that can do this and this person that I think can heal me. Because what happens is we start to live our lives thinking this person is the answer. Their resources can make me whole. This can fix me. It's not in my marriage, it's this, all that stuff. And then we go and we just create more and more wounds and we don't know the depth of it. And we traumatize one another. And so I just have to make this decision. I'll be the solution to somebody's problem. I'm not gonna let them be the solution. I'm not gonna look at people that way. And I found that this is the way God takes care of us is through the kindness and the graciousness of other people when we just let God do God's thing. <laughs> And then finally, I just encourage you, a really good way to just put this into practice is to spend time with people finding out their story. Like find out people's personal story, their personal details, just listening, listen to their story. No judgment, no anything. Ask lots of questions. Acknowledge, man, you have been through a lot. You've been through a lot. Hear their stories. This process of things that I'm, uh, we're kind of going through as a family has given me the opportunity to hear some stories about my wife's family and my wife's mom that I didn't know before. And I hope it's okay if I share this, Cindy, but we were sitting at uh, her, her table the other, the other night, and, and I just said to her, I said, Cindy, you, you are one of the most fierce, courageous people I've ever met. And you might not feel that way, but when you talk about what you've been through in your life and that you're here... And, what, and, and it's these, these stories that I've known her for 25 years, 30 years. Can you imagine that? And, and, and she's very quiet, and you'd never, you'd never, you'd, you would never think it, but this is one of the most courageous people, strongest people I've ever met, but just quietly going through. But it's, it's only when we listen and hear those stories. Now, I just want you to say that's one time in my life where I got it right listening to somebody's story, okay? Do, I mean, do not present me as some model, okay? That's, that's, that's just, an, like I said, it takes about 25 years to get one good story out of my life of me actually living this out, okay? But when we hear those stories, I, if I just will suspend judgment about a person's life, their experiences, and just listen, it's really difficult to start seeing them as like commodities and resources. They become human beings. And that's how this makes the world a better place, right? So we're a community for people that want to make their life and this world better. I know some of you would say, well, that's not very spiritual. <laughs> okay, the Bible way of saying that is we want to bring glory to God. <laughs> now some of you are like, okay, I can do that. But that's, that's just to me, that's the normal way of saying to bring glory to God is to make my life better and to make the world better. That's what peacemaking is, right? And so here's the thing. When we live this out, when we crucify objectification, there's always a resurrection. That's the beauty of the cruciform life. There's always a resurrection. And so when, when objectification goes into the grave with Jesus, what walks out is human dignity in our world. That's what walks out of the grave. 
because human dignity is what just, it, it, it fuels everything in the gospel. The gospel is the most human-centered activity ever. And, and so when we crucify objectification, when we refuse to use people as objects, human dignity starts to flourish. And here's the thing about human dignity. Human dignity, right? <laughs> it's the beginning to the end of poverty. It's the beginning to the end of economic exploitation. It's the beginning to the end of racism. It's the beginning of the end of war. Because when human dignity is on the rise and flourishing and our lives and our cultures and our governments are being transformed, killing is no longer an option. <laughs> Taking what isn't ours is no longer an option. There's something deeply important about this, this resurrection that God will take place. It's why Christian communities should be the most gracious, generous, welcoming, inclusive places on the planet because we should get this. We should get this. So the deeper our understanding of human dignity, the deeper our understanding of the gospel actually is. So as we wrap up today, I like to end with the question, what's God inviting you into? I always believe that there's an invitation from God, the universe, whatever word you like to use, into our hearts, our lives, if we'll just listen. I hope that God is inviting you. I know this is what I felt as I was thinking about this talk, that God's inviting me to stop using people for my personal benefit to stop doing that, to look for it. Where am I doing it? Where is it subtly happening? Where are people moving away from their priority and their individuality and their autonomy into tools and resources for me? I want to change our human resource department name as a step because I don't want people to ever work here and think they're just a resource. I don't want you as a volunteer to think you're just a resource. That's, that's, that's just pulling away human dignity in very subtle little ways. Perhaps maybe God's inviting you. You're in a situation where you know you're being used. You're being objectified, but somebody told you you have to stay being objectified. And you're being used in whatever context, but you were given some warped understanding of love, some warped understanding of the gospel, and the Spirit of God is saying, set a boundary, end a relationship. Set a boundary, end a relationship. And you just need to find that courage, and that's where God's inviting you into. And maybe... Maybe some of us have been in this space where we've been looking for rules about divorce and marriage in, in the year 2022 from something that was written in the year generously 70 AD about cultural institutions and legal documents that have really very little bearing on what those institutions are today. And so maybe you're just being invited by the Spirit to just recognize these are not one-for-one -one correlations, that divorce, remarriage, marriage, these ideas in antiquity are very different than here and what, what God is revealing as we've grown as human beings. And you just need to find freedom in that. Look for the wisdom. Stop trying to chase down a rule to please a God that's only pleased if you get it all right. It's just not grace. It's not love. So our closing song today is one for you to enjoy. Well, they're all there for you to enjoy, hopefully. <laughs> but this one, you don't, don't, it's brand new. So don't feel like you need to sing along. If you, if you want to, you can. But um, this song says, Christ be all around me. Christ be all around me. And it's a prayer, really, that says, how do I see all the faces around me as Christ? How do they see it in me? How do I wake up every morning? Right? And that will produce this human dignity. That will, that's like the red light button for objectification of human beings is to see Christ all around me. So we're going to sing this song. While we sing this song, I want to encourage you to finish filling out that Connect card if you'd love to. I love the Connect cards. They're like my dream to receive Connect cards from you. Put a prayer request on there. Um, if you want some information about anything, you can do that and drop that as you exit today. But we're going to sing this song, and then I'll have our blessing for the week to hopefully send us out being encouraged by having been together and experienced God with one another. Or if you're tuning in online, the same is true, experiencing it together.
eyes of God look upon be my side and as I wait Blessing. Maybe you still got your pen in your hand. Uh, I forgot to say this earlier. Uh, if, you, if you would write this down, 207, I'll go slow, 
207-608-1106. I'll give it one more time, 207-608-1106. That's my cell phone number. And so if you have a question about anything that you've experienced here at Crossroads, you want to talk, you want to have coffee, that's there. It's 207-608-1106. I always feel like I'm on a telephone when I give that. Lines are open. <laughs> Um, if, if, if we haven't ever had the opportunity to have coffee and just get to know one another, I really genuinely would love to do that. I really would. Now, if you're a guest and you want to learn more about our church, uh, I just want to be available to do that. And uh, I'm just, I'm an Americano. It's a cheap date. I don't get all the fluffy stuff anymore. So uh, whatever. But I'd love to do that if you want to just send me a text and we'll get it on the calendar. Um, these are complex passages that... that speak to not only our reality today, which is amazing, that's the inspiration behind scripture, but they also come to us from real discussions that were happening in Jesus's culture, and in particular, in the culture at the time they were written. So as Matthew is writing this gospel, whoever Matthew is, like these are important topics at that time. They're debating these issues, and so they're bringing teachings of Jesus at that moment as well. Um, I, so I hope that maybe if you heard something today, you're like, oh, wait a second, because I know these topics get talked about that just reach out. And I'm, I don't ever, if you have a question, I don't ever take offense to that. I don't ever feel threatened. Uh, I believe what I believe today. I could read an article or listen to a podcast that changes all that tomorrow. Uh, so so let's, let's chat if you want to, or if you just want to get to know more about Crossroads or myself. And I would love to get to know you better. So do me a favor, stand up if you would like. Uh, we're going to head out to the week. Uh, of, as being peacemakers, and we just have a blessing. If you're a guest this morning, this is the way we finish all of our uh, uh, worship services, with just a spoken blessing into our lives. If you're comfortable, uh, I would just encourage you to open up your arms. Open up your arms like this. Uh, spread out a little bit. If you don't want to touch the person next to you, I totally understand that. But uh, if you're comfortable, to just as a, as a physical sign of just wanting to receive the truth in this. So may God bless you and keep you this week, and may your hearts be filled with hope and rest. And may your minds be clear and your thoughts be gracious. And during this Lenten season, may you find the courage to own your objectifications. And for those who are feeling used and objectified, may you find the courage to set a boundary. And may all of us find the strength to live a cruciform life. May we bury our tendency to see people as commodities so that God might resurrect human dignity in our own hearts first and in our world. And so God, will you inspire the leaders of our country and our world through wise counsel to find a path to peace without more death. And this week, open our eyes and our hands that we might be your hope in the world. Amen. Have an amazing week, everybody.